What's up, you guys? Your boy Ben Mahari here, represent Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to all my subscribers out there. Hope y'all been having a good weekend thus far. You know what I'm saying? And uh, hope y'all been staying safe out there. Um, I wanted to particularly, you know, do this video because this is actually, I can't, I couldn't believe that, that today is August 1st. And today is actually the 20th anniversary of the death of Corey Stringer. Um, he was a former offensive lineman for the uh, Minnesota Vikings. And he was coming off his uh, Pro Bowl season when he tragically died on that day, August 1st of 2001 in Mankato, Minnesota, from a heat stroke. Um, Corey Stringer was born on May 8th, 1974. Um, he was born out of, from, from Warren, Ohio. And he was playing, he was drafted by the Vikings for, uh, 24th overall in the first round of the 1995 draft. And he played at least uh, six seasons with the Vikings from 95 up, but actually, yeah, six seasons up until uh, 2000. Um, that previous year in 2000, um, he had his uh, best year of his career by far and earned a trip to the Pro Bowl as a uh, left guard. But the reason why I'm talking about this is, is that today is the 20th anniversary of his tragic death when he died from a uh, heat stroke that happened out in Mankato. Now, this really to set the scene about this whole incident about what happened, okay? What I'm here to tell you guys about is that this death, his death really changed how the NFL, and particularly in sports for that matter, changed how they did their protocols in terms of understanding hydration, understanding body temperatures, and really understanding about, about the, 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 the anatomy of the human body in terms of how it handles the heat. Because think of it this way. In Mankato, which is uh, about at least about two hours away from Minneapolis, okay. Mankato, especially during the uh, summer periods, can be very hot and very very humid. And the reason, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is, is that for even for a normal, you know, healthy person like myself or or, or any of you, you know, hanging out in that humidity for that long is very, very exhausting and it, it can feel like you're in the Sahara Desert. That's how bad the humidity can be. And I know a lot of people that live in the Minnesota can, can tell you that and people in the Midwest can tell you how much the humidity in the Midwest can be very, very draining. But at the time of his death, you know, he was developing himself into one of the best offensive linemen. But heading into that week, um, they were actually... This was the first week of training camp, okay? And as I was reading about a lot of the stuff that took place during that period of time, okay, um, when they began practice on July on July 30th, this was two days before his death, the weather at that time was pretty much stifling, especially out in Minnesota. Uh, the temperature at that time was nearly uh, 90 degrees, and the humidity was like at 70, I think. And... He was out there practicing, as normally he would, out in Minnesota, out of Mankato, at the Minnesota State University, out in Mankato. And he, in the course of that practice, uh, vomited three times. Now, I'm going to show you guys a photo that was taken uh, by the Star Tribune to really understand how bad it was. This was the photo right here um, that was taken by a Star Tribune photographer explaining how bad the humidity was. Now, it's pretty much a huge foreign thing to think about how it was back then, but you pretty much worked out, you know, out in the heat. And a lot of times, you know, training trainers, coaches would retain water from you because they've always had the stigma of, you know, if you if you're basically drinking out water, you know, you're not tough enough. You know, you you, you don't need no water. You're not, you know, you're not exhausted or anything like that. It was it was pretty much the norm at the time. And when he, and when uh. Corey Stringer saw this photo on the front page of the sports section of, of the Star Tribune. He was pissed off about this. And he pretty much made it a mission that he was going to prove that he was not out of shape and that he was going to come back with much more intensity. Not understanding the fact that he was already pretty much in shape. Because remember, he was pretty much in shape. He was, uh, he was around 6'4", and he was at, the, at his lowest weight at the time, 335 pounds. And so that day afterwards, he was basically, he basically went into a, uh, a, uh, 
air-conditioned trailer adjacent outside of the fields at Minnesota State University. And after he after he pretty much told his teammate that he was embarrassed and angry about it, you know, he promised that he was going to come back with much more intensity, as I said. But pretty much the narrative at the time was that the guy, his body was, was beginning to betray him, and nobody else knew about it. And if the trainers would have basically, you know, saw that, they probably would have done much more things to save him. But I'm going to get to that in a bit. The next day, however, on July 31st, the heat index at the time was a measure of the weather it feels like when it's given based on the combination of temperature and, and humidity. And once again, it was higher than 90 degrees. And when the team took the field in full pads that morning, the uh, stringer vomited at least once and then pretty much briefly left to have his ankle taped, but then pretty much completed the practice. But then, but then, you know, later on in the day, he began to show signs of distress. According to one of the Vikings players, you know, one of the, one of six Vikings players actually suffered heat illness that day. And during post-practice workouts, he slipped while trying to hit a blocking bag and pretty much fell on his back with his arms over his head. A moment that pretty much memorialized you know, by a freelance photographer who initially withheld the uh, shot out, out of respect to the family, of course. Now, that was a moment that I remember much remembered, like, that I remember watching it, uh, hearing it on the news and on the newspapers and thinking to myself, like, why didn't anybody, you know, help this guy? You know what I mean? I'm not saying, like, they weren't trying to help him, but they weren't they weren't doing the necessary steps in making sure that he was, that he was pretty much hydrated and keep his body temperature down. Because... The uh, normal body temperature for any person is pretty much 90 degrees. You know what I mean? But his body temperature, when he was admitted to the uh, St. Joseph's Mayo uh, uh, Hospital, he was pretty much, his body temperature was at 108.8. Think about that. 108.8. All right? The man was literally dying in front of everybody. And literally was trying was trying to do his best to complete the practice but he was literally dying in front of everybody and I have no earthly idea why the Vikings didn't do anything to try to save this man. Todd Stuzzi, who used to be his teammate at the time, who was a free agent and left for Carolina, said it best. If they would have poured a ice bu bucket of a water at, as a Gatorade cooler size and dumped it on Corey, it would have pretty much saved his life. And I definitely agree with that. Absolutely. Because they, they pretty much neglected uh, helping this man, giving him with proper water and the proper medical care to, for heat stroke. And then after he was admitted to the hospital, um, unfortunately, at 1.50 a.m. on August the 1st, he pretty much passed away because of organ failure because of the heat stroke. So pretty much in other words, he suffered heat stroke and one of his organs, you know, pretty much failed. And after in the aftermath, you know, the Minnesota State Occupational Safety and Health Administration investigated his death, and they pretty much cleared the Vikings of any responsibility. However, the other governing labor laws, you know, would fi find the Vikings would be held liable if they were proven if they were negligent or had any inflicted intentional harm. And looking at the autopsy, they said that the Stringer was not taking supplements, which I don't, which I'm finding to be somewhat ridiculous. Like, I don't think it would have mattered if he was taking his supplements. The man was pretty much working out and practicing in very humid weather. It would have not mattered what supplements he was taking. They didn't give him any proper water or proper hydration, and it led to his death. It was completely preventable. And to this day, I just feel, you know, somewhat disgusted at the Vikings organization for not doing the proper thing to protect this man. So let me switch the photo now. So looking back at that time, you know, I was about eight years old. I was eight entering about to be nine in a couple of months in 2001. And I remember that story, you know, coming around the airwaves and pretty much shocking the entire state and not just not just the state, but the entire country, especially the NFL, because his death, in a sense, really changed the entire change a lot of the protocol in terms of how you know how people how play how training camps are handling the players now you know what i mean and so 
in the aftermath of this, major changes were were made in preventing you know heat stroke throughout the entire uh, the entire league. His death also addressed the complication of pressuring the players to bulk up, because at the time of his death, once again, I said he was six four, weighing three hundred thirty thirty five pounds. It was his lowest weight he ever been in his career, and then you saw a lot of the offensive linemen in the in the two decades after that started to really slimmer down, started to weigh down between below below two not far two eighty to at least three hundred pounds, slimmering down. You know, not worrying about trying to bulk up to like 300 plus pounds. You know what I mean? And also, many, many pro, many of the teams also trained in light color uniforms. And also, they also address the issue of, you know, hydration. Because now there's a certain, there's a certain threshold that you have to have before you practice out in the field. And I think there was another thing that, that really, really drew on me. I read an ESPN article this morning where, you know, when he, when Matt Burke was, was a rookie at the time, you know, practicing. And he talked about how the, the more you sweat in training, the saying goes, the less you beat in battle. You know what I mean? And when he talked about how he died, he talked about, Matt Burke specifically talked about how, tra how training in Mankato was pretty much hotter than hell. And that you had, you had a long practice right in front of you. And and he said and he also talked about and quote, I can remember saying to myself, look, you're not going to die, honestly. You're not going to die. So come on, let's do this. So when Corey died, you were like, Really? Really? He actually did die? And it just and it just hit you hit you that, wow, you could actually die playing football. I knew you could get seriously hurt. I knew you could blow out your knee. Neck injuries, but by gosh, it was unbelievable, end quote. And so, absolutely, I think in a sense, in my personal view, Corey's death really, it, there was a lot of things that came out of, a lot of good that came out of it, though, despite the fact that his, that the man's life was taken away from him. The NFL, you know, was gradually over time had to, for, was forced to, ch to change a lot of their protocols, as I said, but before, in the aftermath of that, you know, I'm talking about the week after that, the NFL didn't make any immediate changes, but the entire culture was pretty much changed after that. And so one of the big things that they did change pretty much after that, you know, now the big change that, that really helped out the NFL was is that, you know, players, football players, can lose up to eight to twelve liters of fluid per day during preseason. So the big step that they also did was the first step was to maintain hydration. So specifically, they use a specific gravity, which means players are given a benchmark that they must hit in order to participate in that in that day's activity. A policy that that the Vikings used in two thousand and six, and then gradually a lot of the, the other NFL teams started to doing this. That it's something that could have helped them out. And based on new protocols, you know, Stringer was certain, was almost certainly not fully recovered from his bombing episodes during the first practices. And now today, the NFL program has now called for a player to be removed from practice entirely after he after they vomited only one time. In addition to that, the NFL also, in the collective bargaining agreement, you know, put do not put pull pads on until the seventh day of training camp at the earliest. And then also the NFL also uses and also employs Gatorade scales, devices that calculate weight loss during practice and prescribe consumption a consumption plan to rehydrate. Some teams use core temperature sensors that are ingested and, for the duration of the practice, transmitted core body temperatures to the medical staff in real time. Vikings players and coaches are also prohibited from wearing the kind of rubber shirts that they once once used to lose weight on hot days. And every and every team emergency action plan required and approved by the NFL safety and uh, NFL health and safety officers, which also spell which also spells out where cold tubs are located, the duration of the cooling process, which can be used on any different player. Yep. So, pretty much in other words, a lot of a lot of the NFL lot, the NFL had to pretty much tell the teams you have to start implementing safety protocols for your training camps and preventing this from happening. And just as I said, you know. All they, the only way that you could have saved 
you know, Corey's life is he would have at least dumped a bucket of ice water onto that man, a huge bucket of it. And I think he would have pretty much saved it. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it's just still unbelievable that it's been 20 years that of his death and how much that death pretty much changed a lot of the training camps, you know, not just in the NFL alone, but in college football, high school, Pop Warner, all different types of levels of football. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you can criticize the NFL for, and I am in full agreement with that. There's a lot of things that the NFL needs to do better in terms of other things. But I think in terms of this subject right here, I think in this case, the NFL, you know, in this case, you know, did the right thing in terms of, you know, understanding the significance of what happened and making the necessary changes and preventing this from happening. Because now, in the two decades after his death, we've rarely heard any of these kind of stories ever happening in training camp now. And I know there's going to be people out there that's going to say, like, well, we sh they should go back to the old days. You know, the old days is what the real men worked in camp. I don't think you would refer that to any athlete. And honestly, if you ask yourself this question, would you prefer, you know, your training, your trainers and your coaches to withdraw water from you when you're pretty much near near death experience out on the field? I don't think you would prefer that at all. And so, you know, it's unfortunate that this man is unfortunately he's gone from this earth. He should be alive right now, you know, living his life with his wife and his son. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, you know, his death brought much, much bigger awareness, you know, in football. And I think that now, you know, in terms of this subject, I think that football, in, in a sense, is in a better place, you know, more of understanding hydration and understanding, you know, heat exhaustion and prevent and making sure that something like this never happens again. And so, you know, it's unfortunate that he's gone from this earth and he should be living his life right now. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And rest in peace to Corey Stringer. And condolences once again to his family as they're living through 20 years to his tragic death. Rest in peace.